Hello and welcome to the latest installment of my one to one series. Today I get to sit down and talk to Peter Cox. Peter Cox is a very well established photographer here in Ireland and his workshops lead him the whole way to Greenland and Iceland. So let's pop inside and let's see what makes Peter tick. True buddy? Subscribe. And you're very welcome to one to one series and we've got Peter Cox with us now. Peter, how are you doing buddy? Not too bad, Jim, but how are you? Good stuff. I'm doing quite well considering what's going on in the world right now. But look, we'll push that to one side because we're not here for that reason, really. I want to know more about you. Who is Peter Cox? I'm the fellow sitting in front of you. Um, <laughs> now, I'm a, I'm a landscape photographer. Uh, I'm Irish. I was uh, lived in the States for about 10 years. And then about, God, what is it now? 15 years ago, I moved back home. And wow. with that, I changed from what I was doing, which was working in IT, to working as a landscape photographer. And uh, so I've kind of, I feel like I'm kind of getting the hang of it at this stage. <laughs> I, I am sure you are from your work. It really isn't. This is the reason why I have you on this, on this series. So tell me this. So you say you lived in Chicago for a bit. So did you ever get to go to the United Center to watch the Chicago Bulls? Since I am a big, massive basketball fan. <laughs> You know, I never, I'm not much of a basketball fan, to be fair. I was there at the height of, uh, of Michael Jordan and all that. Uh, wow. it's, well, it's sort of the tail end of his career, I suppose, before he, he retired. Uh, I was in the United, Center, uh, the United Center once to watch you too, though. So I suppose that's allowable. <laughs> true enough, true enough. So come here, you opened up your gallery back in 2011 and uh, you've some amazing pictures from countries all over the world. But some of my favorite ones that you've ever taken are here in Ireland. So tell me what's so special about Ireland and why is it so iconic for taking photographs? In? What's interesting about Ireland actually is that we love it and it's fantastic and the people that know it love it. But I suppose a little bit, thankfully, maybe the rest of the world hasn't quite cottoned on yet. Um, you know, you like you look at the likes of Iceland and places like that and they're completely overrun with photo tourism. We don't have yes. that here. Uh, you know, you can go to a well-known spot here in Ireland and find nearly nobody or maybe a couple of photographers at most. Um, and it's one of the things that I was I was at first a little disappointed by, but the longer I go on, the happier I am for it. Um, but certainly, I mean, you know, the landscape we have here is incredible. We've got, uh, what I love about Ireland's landscape in particular is that it changes depending on where you are within a very short distance, particularly up and down the West Coast. You know, you're in West Cork, it's one yes, type of landscape. Yeah. You go up into Kerry, it's another one. You go to Dingle, it's another one again, and so on all the way up the coast. Same basic landscape, but the character of it changes so much. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I genuinely, and it's the west coast of Clare where you're typically going to find me. I love Kilkee and up to the Cliffs of Moher and going on from there. It's such a magical place in Ireland. But think of it this way. So you just said there that you go to different countries like Iceland and Greenland, which you've some amazing footage from. And um, which country do you love going back to over and over again and just still has that wow factor every time you visit? For me, I'd say the most dramatic place that I've ever been has been Greenland. Um, okay. I've been there now, I suppose it's twice really. Once was for, I was there for nearly a month in 2015, um, doing uh, photography. We were doing scouting for a trip and that, well, we had already kind of done the scouting, but we were doing fine tune scouting before. Then we take, took a, a few clients out on a small sailing boat. That would be for me, um, certainly the most spectacular. I've been to Antarctica as well. Um, and if you gave me the option of going to Greenland or going to Antarctica, um, unless you were asking me to go to the South Pole, I might change my answer. But other than that, <laughs> it would be uh, to go back to Greenland. That has to be a next bucket list place. Like I've been to a few places and Greenland uh, is definitely on that list and Iceland. There's two countries that have, I've yet to left to kind of go that I really want to go. So, but yeah, yeah, it's on the list. We'll get there someday. But um, look, you are about to release your third book. Um, it's called The Skelligs, The Islands on the Edge of the World. Sorry. And uh, is this going to be the best book yet? <laughs> well, you'd hope that you, uh, you improve each time, right? It's like anything else, practice makes perfect. My first book, which is called The Irish Light, that was published in 2012. Um, Absolutely loved that. I loved it, that one. And you were gracious enough to sign it for me. Thank you very much. It was an amazing book. You're most welcome. Uh, that one was probably the easiest to do because that one was 
a kind of a realization that a book would be a good thing to have. Um, people that come into the gallery don't necessarily want to uh, or have room on their wall for a framed print. Um, True. So a book is a great thing to have. So I said, okay, well, I've got 10 years ish of photography to pull from. So I just went through and I kind of uh, uh, organized this, uh, this, this collection um, as a portfolio yeah. uh, and printed it. And that worked very well. The next book then was Atlantic Light, which I released in 2015. And that one, uh, it went through a couple of interesting changes because I I'd forgotten, in fact, uh, as part of the planning for this book, uh, the Skellig's book, I w rediscovered some old ideas and plans I had for what was going to become Atlantic Light. And the initial idea for it was something completely different. And it ended up being what it was when I knew it was going to have some aerial photography in it but it ended up um, being all aerial photography because I uh, found basically my first trip for the book was up to Donegal and I knew it was going to yeah. be the West Coast. And the idea was it would be a mix of aerials and land-based photography. But I had just taken delivery of uh, the drone that I ended up using for the entire book and had a great shoot in Donegal where I got six or seven photographs within a week, you know, which for wow. uh, for anybody that knows landscape photography, getting that kind of hit rate in that short of a time uh, is pretty good. So I said, all That's right, a great return. Yeah. So I said, I can I can I think I can probably do this now um, entirely aerial stuff and make it be the first book of drone photography, which I believe it, it actually ended cool. up being. Um, so that one was interesting. There was a lot of work in that. And of course, I had all sorts of problems along the way. Um, and now this one again, is it was a more difficult and easier in in different ways okay yeah you're, you're kind of narrowed down to the one area so it's just the skelligs and yeah. it's an absolute beautiful place i've shot there myself i've scuba dive underneath it it's just it's such a magical place to be but you know what the funny thing about, i've never actually stepped foot on the island so but that's on my list this summer also so i will get there eventually tell me with this though when is the book going to be released to the public uh, the book is going to be released, uh, I'm planning for it to be released in August. So the Kickstarter okay. completed last weekend. And Excellent. Yes, it was a massive re uh, response to it. I can't quite believe, given the times that we're in, uh, what, uh, how good of a response that it had. So in fact, it ended up being uh, outstripping the other two fundraisers to be the, so it's the most funded book that I've done. But that, you know, there's still some finishing work that needs to be done to it, mostly just a little bit of writing. Uh, and then within a couple of weeks, I aim to be sending it to the printers and um, then we'll, there'll be a lead time from the printers. And then uh, we'll, I'm, so I'm saying August, it might be a little earlier. Okay. We'll see. I look forward to it. I look forward to it. So on to my favorite part of this series and it is all about gear. So I want to know what, now I've seen some pictures of you using cameras and there's some high profile cameras in there. So I want to know what's the camera you normally shoot on, on land for now? Uh, it depends. Uh, I, where possible, use my phase one. Uh, so I have a phase one uh, medium format system, which is, wow. um, uh, so it's, well, the, it ranges from sort of 80 megapixels, which is the back. So in medium format terms, you talk about a back, like you talk about a film back. Mm -hmm. um, so it's 80 megapixels. Um, and that one I bought in 2012, if you can believe that. And it's still the best camera that I have. Um, and then, you know, I've had uh, on loan a couple of other pieces, uh, you know, okay. uh, for various things, but that's what I tend to use. And then uh, where that one can't be used or it's not practical, uh, I use the Sony a7R2 that I have at the moment. Very good. That's awesome. Now, I currently have a DJI Mavic Pro 2 and I absolutely love it. And it's great for me because it's small, it's petite and it's got a good sensor and it's got a one inch Hasselblad sensor. But you've kind of went one step above most people. Uh, you, so tell me more about the drone that you have. So the drone, so I have a, a Phantom 4 Pro that I use quite a lot, actually. The, the, I, I never would use the Phantom before for serious photography, but now uh, with the 4, and I suppose that's still the current one, uh, and the Mavics, um, the quality of the sensor and the quality of the still images you get out of it is actually very good and certainly usable. But what I use for when I can is the, um, the M600. It's another DJI drone. It's a hexacopter. Um, it's about a meter across and stands about maybe half a meter tall. Uh, and wow. I sling the, um, the Sony a7R uh, underneath it 
with whatever lens I want. Uh, I've actually I've actually flown one of those. It wasn't my own one. It was a different one, but it was exactly the same model. In Chile, I was doing a job for another photographer who was doing a project there. And so I was flying the drone for him and he was making photographs. And the camera we had slung underneath that was a, um, if you like, a, a not quite a prototype, but a pre-production uh, phase one, 100 megapixel uh, camera. Uh, and oh we, were, we were flying this thing at high altitude in the, in the Atacama <laughs> Desert. Uh, so that was a little bit uh, nerve wracking sometimes. Okay, okay, just so the listeners and viewers can know, how much was the camera on that drone worth? Um, I suppose it would have been about, with the lens that was on it, you'd be looking at about 60 grand. Oh my God. <laughs> and wow. in fact, when, I, when we were talking with Phase One at the time, because there was a project we were doing with Phase One, uh, so they provided the gear for us, and uh, uh, on loan, obviously, and I was talking to their tech guys about it and we were, they were saying, what drone are you going to use? And I said, the M600. And they said, yeah, we really usually don't like people using drones that are worth less than the camera. Oh my God, that's insane. But <laughs> well, come here, look, I, I've done a, I've been watching your work for so many years and you like to still shoot and film also. And I've seen you with a four by five, four by five large format camera. Do you still shoot in that still with this in these days? I don't. Uh, so what I've learned shooting with those cameras, and I also have uh, some old medium format cameras as well, um, film cameras, and I love shooting with those cameras. I really enjoy the process, uh, particularly the large format, but I hate dealing with film. Uh, I, I, I came up in digital um, and I understand film and I can shoot with it, but dealing with, uh, like with four by five, one of the, you know, you've, you've got uh, the flatness of the film can be an issue. Yes, yeah. Um, and then of course there's the dust and the scanning. Now it's interesting that you ask because I really enjoy shooting with it and I hate the scanning. But now I've learned recently that, you know, there are companies in the UK that do scanning of four by five uh, sheets okay. at fairly affordable rates. And you wouldn't shoot a lot, you know, if you're shooting a project. No. So no. I have it in the back of my mind that I might like to do a project just on uh, four by five, just to have the excuse to get okay. one of those cameras again and get back into it. That's interesting, very interesting. So come here, you did say that you lived in America a while back there and did you ever get the, the kind of the itch to kind of go back to and photograph over in America like the likes of Death Valley? Because a lot of photographers now, especially on YouTube, are kind of venturing towards that area now and trying to discover kind of the, like I said, Death Valley and Arizona deserts. Yeah, it's interesting because when I lived there, I didn't, I didn't travel around a lot. I, you know, if you're working in corporate America, you don't get much in the way of holidays. So any okay. holidays I did have, I would spend coming back here to visit friends and family. So I actually didn't uh, see any, I've never been to any of the big national parks okay. with the exception of the Grand Canyon. Um, and I, I used to want to go back. I'd, I, I used to want to go and photograph Yosemite and photograph, you know, all those yes. iconic places. But as time has gone on, frankly, the urge has dropped. I'd like to go and see them, but I don't think I'd even bother taking a camera. Um, wow. Because they're so, it's, I think it would be impossible to come up with anything original. Um, and <laughs> You're right. It, You're right. I mean, or of course. Shoe bench, sure. Yeah, I mean, if you if you got a backpack and you hiked for weeks and you photographed things that were not obvious, uh, you would certainly come up with original things. But talking about you know tunnel view and, and El Capitan mm. and Half Dome, yes. it's all been done to death. And I just don't think I could contribute anything useful to it. Um, and then certainly professionally, you know, I had thought since I do run photography workshops, would I run workshops over there? And I gave it some consideration about five years ago, but I decided in the end. There's just there's so, so many Americans running workshops over there. <laughs> they don't need me coming over and sticking my nose in. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, you're doing quite well what you're doing at the moment, so stick to that for now. Um, but come here, look, we're just about to finish this up. So and what I would love to know is uh, what's next for Peter Cox when this world gets back on its feet? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, obviously, I'm just you know, still dealing with the Skellix project. Um, that's going to be my full focus now until that's shipped and everybody's got their books. And then, of course, there's just dealing with the, 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 the fallout from this. But if, in an ideal world, obviously, I'll work on a new book. Uh, it might well be that 4x5 project. Who knows? Um, but it might take me a while to figure it out. 
Okay, that's awesome. Peter, thank you very, very much for coming and I really do appreciate it. You're very welcome. So guys, if you've liked this episode of the One to One series, please give us a like, subscribe, or if you have any questions for me or Peter, do comment down below and we will do our best to answer them. Thank you very much and we'll see you next week. Hey, yo.